This episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories podcast is intended for mature audiences. It contains strong language, violent recollections, and mature themes that might be inappropriate for younger audiences. By continuing on with this episode, you agree to listening to any and all of these possibly triggering descriptions. Viewer and listener discretion is strongly advised. On my first summer back home from freshman year of college, I picked up a part-time job delivering pizza in a town around 30 minutes away from where I lived. The area, in rural Georgia, is known for having places that are in the middle of nowhere, and the pizza place's whole shtick was that it delivered to even the most remote areas imaginable as long as it was within the town limits. I could film books with the weird experiences that summer from the call that came from a long abandoned warehouse, to the dog that got excited about the pizza in my hand and accidentally shredded my pants with her claws, but one will always stand out in my mind as the creepiest. It was getting fairly late at night, around 10.30pm, so I was confident at the time that I would be sent home with no further calls before closing at 11. However, Someone barely managed to miss the cutoff time, and our clerk accepted their order since they were so close. I was given the address and a single box of hot dough, and sent on my merry little way. The first red flag was the driveway, or rather, the lack thereof. There was a mailbox, but no actual driveway, not even gravel at all. It was just grass, and a barely distinguishable path that resembled more of a service trail than it did something frequently used. I bumped along, wondering if I was even en route to the place, and this is when I saw a slightly above average size house come over the horizon, horribly dilapidated, and completely surrounded by overgrown woods. I guesstimated where the rest of the driveway led to, and ended up parking in a grassy patch that could have been the walkway just as easily as it could have been the front yard. My headlights were aimed towards the porch, as per company policy. I walked up to the door, but I believe that calling it a door is generous. It was a door frame alright, but the door itself was just a large slab of wood, which was propped haphazardly against the side of the house, barely covering the entrance. This was red flag number two. The third and fourth red flag were also on the door. This included the A4 sheet of printer paper with the words around back scribbled in all caps which was hanging just below the place where somebody had self engraved the door with the title Manson Family Ranch. Typically, I would never go around to the back of a house, especially a shady, unlit house, and especially, especially at night. However, it was my last drop of the day and I was ready to get it over with and be on my way home, and against my better judgment, I went around to the back of the house. The door back here was an actual door, but it was covered in both cobwebs and fresh spider webs. Clearly this was a door that had not been used in quite some time. I found the cleanest area available, and I knocked. I counted to 45, and knocked again. There were no lights on in the house, and I could hear no movement from inside either. I knocked and counted again, and repeated the sequence three more times, before I was finally creeped enough to decide to return to my car. As I turned, I finally heard a voice coming from inside the house, clearly agitated, but I couldn't tell what they were saying. I tried to knock one more time, and as I was counting, I heard something in the woods behind me. It started out as just movement deep in the trees, but soon enough, I could make out distinct running footsteps coming directly towards me through the brush. As I'm standing there, coming to terms with my impending demise, I followed the direction of the noise to the edge of the woods, which is around 15 feet away from me. In the moonlight, I could clearly see the woman who stepped out. She was relatively old, maybe in her 60s, I would guess. She had a long blonde gray hair which was tangled and matted and hung down past her hips. She was in what looked to be an originally white nightgown, but at that time it was dingy and closer to a beigeish brown color. 
She was absolutely barefoot, and her feet were covered in dirt and what had to be blood, presumably due to the fact that she had just sprinted through the prickly woods where there was no trail to be seen. I never learned her name, but I still affectionately refer to her as Red Flag Number 5. She stopped short when she saw me and started to shake her head no, eyes wide. I stood there, like a terrified deer in the most messed up headlights ever, as she took a few more steps toward me, reaching out to me, finger pointed. Her voice came out way stronger than mine would have at the time when she spoke. You know how southern people can either sound like loving grandmothers or backwoods murderers? Well, she sounded like the latter when she drawled, Oh, no, 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 honey. No, you get on. You get. Get on out of here. I wish I could say I listened. I ran. I left. But I was so in shock at how events were playing out that my own self-preservation was put on a back burner, all the while trying to figure out just what the heck was happening. She seemed to realize that I was not moving, even if I could not make my mouth move to ask her what was happening, or even what to do with the stupid pizza in my hands. She looked at me like she could have smacked the hell out of me right then and there, and proceeded to deliver red flag 6 through 12. Darling, did you hear me? You deaf or dumb? Young girls like you come out here, and then they don't get to leave. So I finally quit being the white person in a horror movie when I realized that this was not a funny little ghost story. This was a 5 foot 3, 116 pound me potentially being targeted to be robbed, kidnapped, or worse. So I dropped the dumb little pizza, which had serious serial killer toppings by the way, and started running back to my car, which I had stupidly left on and unlocked, as was usual for most of my deliveries. As I neared the vehicle, I heard a slam from behind me, and I looked over my shoulder to see that the wooden door had now been pushed over and had fallen into the porch beneath it. As I was closing the car door, an older man was limping down the front steps, waving his arms like an airplane runway attendant at me, calling me a little bitch, telling me to get out of the car. Now I was at a loss of words on what to do. I called out something muttering and shaking, and along the lines of, Pizza's out back. I now floored my dad's crappy little 90s Lexus, and somehow managed to avoid trees on the odd trail back to the main road, which was still 12 miles and several turns from any road that actually had a name, let alone painted lines. I reported it to my manager, and he said he contacted police, but nothing ever came of it that I'm aware of. Either way, that was my first, and hopefully, the last personal encounter with self-proclaimed Manson Family Ranch. In 2017, in my last semester of high school, some friends and I decided to skip the pep rally for the girls varsity basketball team making the playoffs for the first time. My last period of the day was theater tech. I was just taking it as fine arts credit, and two friends of mine in the grade below me were in that same class. We decided to skip the pep rally, leave school early, and go to the nearby Taco Bell like we did every day. However, Administrators and security guards patrol the parking lots to catch kids trying to skip, so we took a detour through the nature trail on campus in order to avoid them. Once in the nature trail, we came across this kid that I've never seen before. He was a skinny white kid with shaggy black hair, wearing baggy jeans and a plain white t-shirt. He was shorter than me, but the most notable thing about him was his general look of dishevelment. His hair was wild and full of leaves and twigs. His plain white t-shirt was dirty and the knees of his jeans were stained green and brown. To be perfectly frank, he seemed like he had been crawling around in the nature trail. I remember wondering if he lived there for a split second. When we came upon him, we were walking one direction, parallel to the school and to the back of the parking lot, and he was coming directly towards us. I knew the nature trail well enough to know there was a bend that led deep into the woods, and I figured that he had come from there. He was out of breath, and he looked really scared. My two friends said hi to them. My friends were in the grade below me, 
and later told me that the kid was in their grade and was just acquaintances with my two friends. It was supposed to be just a quick hello, but I couldn't help but notice how scared he looked and how suspicious he seemed of us. He asked us what we were doing in the woods, and we told him that we were skipping the pep rally. One of my friends asked, What have you been doing out here? Camping? Me and my other friend gave a nervous laugh, but the kid didn't crack a smile. He explained that he was dropped off at school that morning and was supposed to get on a bus to take him to DAEP. DAEP was the alternative school that kids who got suspended from school went to. His plain outfit now started to make sense. It was the infamous uniform of the alternative school. He then explained that he didn't want to go to the alternative school, so when his mom dropped him off, he pretended like he would wait for the bus and then hid in the nature trail the full eight hours of the school day. He was still acting really skittish, and without even looking at each other or speaking to one another, my friends and I could feel that something wasn't right and that we were in some kind of danger. The kid looked around nervously often, as if seeing if someone might have been following us, or if we were alone in the woods. We hit him with an, alright man, well good luck, we're going to try to get to our cars and go home before the pep rally ends. When he heard the word cars, he perked up. He started walking with us towards the parking lot, continuing to talk. He becomes a lot more friendly and asks if we can give him a ride home. We give him some half-baked excuse why we couldn't. We didn't expect him to ask that. I never met him and my friends barely knew him, but he doesn't take no for an answer. He tells us that people were going to start looking for him pretty soon and that he was going to be in a lot of trouble. We tell him that he'd probably be fine hiding there that deep in the nature trail, but he tells us, Nah man, you don't understand. I broke into a car at the fellowship. He pointed in the direction of the mega church that had a parking lot that backed up to my school. I took this. From his waistband he pulled out a handgun and I felt sick to my stomach. I had never seen a gun in real life. At this point I really felt in danger. Not just because he had produced a gun, I'd never really been scared of them. More so that the entire interaction felt uneasy and that the guy was already unsettling and desperate. One of my friends very cautiously tells him that he should probably just ditch it and take off somewhere else. Then he just stood there, staring at us for an uncomfortable amount of time. His eyes were meeting each of ours. I broke the silence by saying that we wouldn't tell anyone, but that we really had to go before the pep rally ended, and my other stupid ass friend, who had been virtually silent the entire time, spoke up and said, Yeah, and it's best we're not around if they start looking for you for that, gesturing to the handgun. His eyes narrowed and once more he asked if one of us could take him home. This time, it felt more like a command. I've never been a super brave person, but in that moment, I don't know why. I just blurted out, Nah man, I'm good. Again, there was an uncomfortable silence. Then he asked, Before you leave, do you guys want to see something? My first friend was kind of a hothead, and although he was uncomfortable with the situation, he was not afraid of conflict, nor was I. My other friend, however, was not a fan of conflict and always would de-escalate first. We all looked at each other, and me and my first friend kind of had an unspoken understanding, sort of like, if this is going to happen, if we have to run or fight, we must have to do it now. My other friend was very visibly afraid. He asked, What do you want to show us? And before the kid could answer, my friend said, We don't want to see. We have to go. My first friend started briskly walking past the kid, and me and the other friend quickly followed. Within a few steps, we just started sprinting towards the parking lot. I looked back once we were about 50 steps away. I looked back, and he was still standing there, watching us run. He had put the gun back in his waistband before taking a small adjacent trail, which led back deeper into the woods. By the time we made it to the parking lot, there were police everywhere. We were sweating, out of breath, and completely terrified. Needless to say, they found the kid in the next 10 minutes. Somehow, however, in all that chaos, nobody saw us exit the nature trail and go into the parking lot. 
but since there were so many cops in that parking lot, we decided just to head back inside through another side door to find that the door was locked. That's when an administrator found us, brought us inside, and shoved us into a classroom where we were able to talk with others and find out what was going on. This is what we could piece together from what we learned. Turns out, that kid that had skipped DAEP, he hid in the nature trail, broke into a car at the church, and stole a semi-automatic shotgun and a handgun from the car. After stealing the guns, he texted his girlfriend and told them that he was about to do something really terrible, and that when she saw his name on the news, she should turn off the TV. He told her explicitly that he was going to kill kids at school. She knew he was supposed to be in DAEP and was so worried about the text messages that she contacted the police. DAEP went on lockdown until police officers got a call from a guy at the church that the two guns had been stolen from his car behind the school and that's when they put two and two together and caught him hiding in the woods. I guess when he saw me and my two friends in the nature trail, he quickly hid the shotgun but didn't have time to hide the pistol or didn't care enough to hide. TLDR We accidentally met a kid with plans to shoot up the school while I was attempting to skip and he showed me his gun. This is not my story but instead my sisters who will be using my account to share it with you all. When I was in high school, I was good friends with a girl called Emma. Emma was kinda quiet and shy, but always was there if you needed her. When I finished high school, I lost touch with Emma, as what happens to a lot of friendships after school. Two years later in college, I started dating a guy called Ben, and Ben's best friend Gary was Emma's boyfriend. After discovering we all knew each other, we started to hang out again. One of the nights we planned to all hang out in Gary's house, have a few drinks, and play a few games. Myself and Ben showed up at about 8pm to Gary's house, and Gary said Emma should be over soon. That was fine. We opened our beers and started drinking. It was now nearly 9pm, and Emma still wasn't here, so we decided to ring her. Emma answered and apologized for being late, and she said she was just finishing up getting ready and should be there soon. At 9.30pm, there was still no sign of Emma, so we called again. This time, her younger brother picked up the phone. Her brother was 15 years old at the time, and it told us that Emma was not feeling that well and was in the bathroom. Gary was worried and asked if he could head over and check up on her but her brother was adamant that he was looking after Emma and she was alright and to enjoy our evening. We didn't go home. Instead, we kept drinking and hanging out because we all thought Emma was just having a simple flu. Just after 10pm, we decided to call one last time and check up on Emma. Again, her brother answered and calmly told us that Emma had gone to bed and she will call in the morning. We left it at that believing she was safe at home in bed and didn't want to annoy her brother by non-stop calling. That evening, Emma's mom returned home at 12am and she found Emma dead on the kitchen floor. Emma had been bludgeoned to death by her younger brother a couple of hours earlier. We later found out when Emma was leaving to come to us that she and her brother had gotten into a fight about something ridiculous and he had beat her with a baseball bat and then stabbed her over 51 times. Since her brother was a minor, he was not going to be sent to prison. Instead, her brother pleaded insanity and was sent to an institution. Now, a lot of this information was not leaked, as the accused was a minor. However, I do know that his parents stuck by him, and he was released after four years. Hey everyone. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it so you can be notified of any and all future scary stories narration videos coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. I'm sure you're going to enjoy your stay. Now, let's continue on with these scary stories. For some background information, I am a 22-year-old woman 
who grew up in my parents' house in southern Mississippi in a very small secluded neighborhood that roughly has 10 to 15 other people that lived in it as well. This neighborhood is connected to a river that runs behind it and it has trails leading to the river with an old paved road connecting to the houses. From the age of 10 years old, my parents warned me about a man that lived in the corner over a hill which was down the road from my parents' house. My parents called him Dirty Joe and he lived with his dad who they called Yankee Joe. I was told never to go down that road in front of their house by myself. I didn't question my parents because I knew they were concerned for my safety. So fast forward to when I was 15. I was at a friend's house. It was a Saturday afternoon. I rode my bicycle to my friend's house, which was on the other side of the neighborhood. Eventually, I had to leave. So I left around 5 p.m. I was riding my bicycle and instead of taking the long way to my house, I decided to take the shorter way, which would be using the road in front of Dirty Joe's house. This was a big mistake. Knowing of my parents' warning, I began to pedal as fast as I could. I was passing the house, when out of nowhere, a bearded man with brown eyes, that looked to be around 35 years old, approached me and got in front of my bicycle. He said, Hey, can I ask you a question? I tried to get around him, but he grabbed my handlebars and held the bike still, and I wasn't going to leave my bike with him, that's for sure. So, irritated, I responded with a, yeah, what? He said, will you marry me? I was of course shocked and disgusted at the same time, and I blurted out, no, you're like 35. He then proceeded to tell me that he liked me out of all the girls in the neighborhood who were my friends because I didn't seem like a slut. I was terrified by that point and was still struggling to free my handlebars. He holds my handlebars so tight that his fists are turning white. He then begins to tell me that when my friend Misty was walking home one night two years ago from my parents' house, he grabbed her off the road in front of his house and then he proceeded to tie her up and forcefully had his way with her right on his front porch. After hearing this, I was extremely petrified and immediately passed out. When I came to, he was crouched over me, asking me, Are you okay? Do you need to come inside for a minute? I jerked up and said, Hell no, stay away from me. Miraculously, I was able to grab my bicycle and ride as fast as I could home and immediately told my dad, who then scolded me for going down that road alone. I immediately called Misty and asked if it was true, and she began crying and saying yes. I couldn't believe it. I told Misty that I needed to call the cops, but she begged me not to do so because she didn't want to deal with it all over again. I respected her wishes and didn't call them only because she asked me not to do so, but it didn't stop there. A few years later, when I was 17 years old, I was at my neighbor's house and my friend, who was 22 and much bigger than I was, wanted to go to the river that was on the other side of the neighborhood. She wanted to use the shorter way, which of course meant we had to use the road in front of Dirty Joe's house. I didn't like the idea, but at least this time I wasn't alone. We began walking and we just reached the top of the hill. This is when a straggly, frail skinny old man with a long white beard came out of the bushes. I recognized him as Yankee Joe, Dirty Joe's father. He looks at me and my friend and says, Don't let him touch her because he will hurt her and points to his son, that being Dirty Joe, who is standing near the road in front of his house. My friend bluntly said, He will not touch her as long as I'm here or I will hurt him. The old man just started to laugh hysterically. This truly unnerved me, but my friend insisted that we keep walking. We walked right past him, and he didn't do anything but stare at us, mostly at me. This is until he could no longer see me. It does make me think. What if I were alone at the time? Would he have tried something? So creepy man named Dirty Joe let's not ever meet again.
Update. I recently visited my parents' house and I was talking to them about normal things. This is when my dad mentions that the old guy that lived on the hill right before Dirty Joe's house had gone missing and no one can find him. This old man was at least 80 years old and not very mobile. What makes it even more creepy is that Dirty Joe and Yankee Joe are now living in that house instead of their own house and are also using the old guy's land for their personal storage. The cops are currently investigating, but I wouldn't doubt that they murdered the old man for his land and his property. I shared this true story in hopes that it will make people more aware of the people around them and that a neighbor is not always friendly. Naturally, I'm a follower of horror and this subreddit and similar subreddits as well. I've posted one of my stories on Reddit a few months ago, so here's another one. When I was younger, every year for Christmas, I would drive upstate to my aunt's house along a stretch of highway. I cannot for the life of me remember the name of this road. All I know is it runs nearby Akron, New York at some point. However, most of the drive is through rural areas with little to no towns nearby. So it was the dead of night and my groggy self had gotten off a long shift and had to drag my ass to my aunt's house since my extended family was expecting me the following morning. Near halfway through the drive, I realized that I was low on gas, which really irritated me. My brother told me he had filmed it up the day before, so either he forgot or was straight up lying. Anyway, I saw an archaic looking sign for a gas station off the next road. It wasn't an official road sign, literally a pole with a slab of metal attached with a gas off next exit or something along those lines painted on it. That seemed a little bit sketchy, but people do the same thing for fruit stands on highways, so whatever. I pulled off the next exit on some dilapidated country ass road through some dense woods. The whole thing was creepy and surreal. I kept expecting Leatherface to come running out of the trees with a chainsaw. Anyway, eventually I came to the gas station and I realized quickly that it hadn't been open for years. It was all rusted and the convenience store's roof was caving in. The gas pumps had all been taken out as well. So I pulled over next to it and checked my gauge. I was probably only going to make it another half mile before running out. So I called a AAA and they said they send over a truck. Now I played the waiting game. I left my engine on because when the headlights were off, everything was pitch black and my paranoid self wasn't sitting next to an abandoned gas station, especially in the middle of a forest in complete darkness. So most of the wait went uneventful until I sensed movement around the side of the old store where my lights were currently pointed at. I looked up but didn't see anything more, so I looked back down at my phone. Then over the sounds of the night, I hear someone yell, Hey buddy, come here, in a demanding tone. I look up, and I kid you not, there is a dude standing by the old store, looking directly at me, illuminated by my headlights. He looked like a run-of-the-mill homeless guy. I was honestly spooked, and figured he must have been squatting there. Still watching him, I rolled down my window and yelled something like, Yeah, what's up? Still mentally crapping myself. I had my foot ready to floor it out of there at the first sign of trouble. You got any change? Nah, I don't. Sorry, man. I look up at him, and he has this kind of vacant expression and is standing stiff. Then I see more movement. There are heads. About twenty or so heads peeking around trees beyond the man I'm talking to. I can't see them clearly at all, but they are definitely people, literally just heads staring in my direction from around the trees. I see another guy beginning to walk around from the gas station, and then I turn around and sped off. I got as far away from that place as my tank could carry me, and I updated AAA on my location. The driver came back over and filled me up, and I didn't say anything, but after he left, I went to call the cops, so I called the nearest town sheriff's department. 
They said they'd send a trooper over and I give them the location. When I got to my aunt's house, they called me back and said whoever was there was now gone, but they could tell a large number of people had been living there for quite a while. Blankets, canned food, the usual. The whole situation still freaks me out to this very day, but frankly I consider myself lucky I'll always have a creepy story to tell people. I'm just glad that nothing bad happened. And yeah, to the creepy dudes at the gas station, let's not meet. I'm writing this the next day, and I'm honestly still shaken up about it. It was about 2 in the morning, and I was leaving a buddy's house after a get-together to catch up. I've done this walk at least a few hundred times, at all hours of the day and late at night, so I was fairly confident of my safety. The walk was short, maybe 25 to 30 minutes, more or less. I was wearing a backpack with random stuff inside of it, so I had a bit of a load. I was a little bit stoned considering I smoked a little bit before leaving, so I decided to listen to something on YouTube. I went to switch things up from listening to music, so I decided to listen to scary stories. I loaded up a corpse husband video and put in my headphones. I'm walking and listening. And I kid you not, two minutes into the video, I hear a voice behind me. Hey you, half and half. I instantly know he means me because of my hair. I have it split dyed, half black, half blonde. I casually looked behind me while I was walking, and I see who had called out to me. There were three men that were following. All of them were tall and dressed in dark clothes. One of them was holding a pipe, or a bat, I couldn't tell. Stop walking and drop your bag. We have a gun. My heart was in my throat. I was terrified. I looked around ahead of me, and I saw a police officer amongst a few cars in the four-way traffic, a few dozen yards ahead of us. I silently prayed for it to turn down my road, but it continued forward. I zoned out in the police car, and I didn't notice the men getting closer. I heard one of them getting very close, and I took off as fast as I could. I ran across the four-way near the high school and hopped a few fences and ran through backyards, anything to get as far away as possible. I got a few blocks away and got onto the road, only to be greeted by a police officer. Get on the ground, now. He had a taser drawn and a flashlight in my eyes. I immediately complied and got to the ground and then he asked me why I was running and hopping fences at 2 in the morning, and I told him I was trying to get away from people trying to attack me. He paused for a second and said, Get up. I stood up, and he looked at me and said, Were you just walking up, insert street name here? Yeah, officer. I was. Were you the officer I saw with the cars? I replied. He nodded and told me he saw the man behind me. I told him my routing so he understood why I was trespassing so many yards and he told me that I wasn't in trouble since I was fleeing for safety. The officer had me describe the man as much as possible and proceeded to radio everything in. Afterwards, he followed me home in his car, never more than two blocks away. I got home safe and thanked him, but I didn't sleep much that night. Back in 2013, I had just started an education, and after the first school period had ended, I had to find an internship to be able to progress, but at the time, it had proved to be almost impossible to get one, so while I was looking, I decided to take another job just to make sure we had food on the table. After searching for a while, I found out a friend of my fiancé's family had his own handicap bus company a kind of taxi service for wheelchair users or otherwise disabled people, and he needed someone to cover the night shift since it was a bus that had to be on call at least 22 hours a day. Seeing that I'm quite the night owl, I immediately told them that I'd be happy to take the job, and after I got the needed license, I was hired. The job was pretty basic, pick up people and drop them off where they needed to go and sometimes use a machine to get wheelchairs up or down some stairs, and when there were no trips, I drove to a designated area 
and did whatever while waiting. I quickly found a truck stop in the area where I could park and catch some Z's while waiting. There was a gas station where I could buy coffee in the early hours of the shift, and on the other side of the gas station's parking lot, on the opposite side of the truck stop, there was a rundown restaurant with a motel connected to it. To not disturb the sleeping truckers if I got a trip in the middle of the night, I usually parked on the restaurant side. After parking there every night for a while, I noticed one particular room had a lot of people come and go. In the beginning, I thought nothing of it, but then one night in the end of the summer, while I was half asleep with the window slightly open, I suddenly heard yelling coming from the motel, and a dude came tumbling out of the room, and then started running, and then a few seconds later, a big dude came running after him, with something in his hand that I could not make out what it was. I thought that it was none of my business, and went back to my half-sleeping waiting stage. Not much time passed, and my phone went off. I had a trip an hour's drive away, so naturally I turned on the bus and was leaving the parking lot when I saw the big guy coming around the corner. For the rest of the night I had back to back trips, so I didn't park until I got home. The day after, I didn't get a return to home zone until 2 or 3 am. When I arrived at the parking lot, the area where I used to park had fist sized rocks strewn all over the place, not connecting the dots at the time. I just parked a few spots over and started waiting. I fell asleep pretty fast, but was jerked back into reality when a car right in front of my bus honked its horn, flashed the high beams, and revved up its engine. I thought it was just some idiot who noticed me sleeping and found it funny to try to wake me up, so I jumped out of the bus about to tell him to screw off, but instead of driving off or stopping, the driver made the start brake thing with the car indicating that I was the one who should go away and screw off. And then I connected the dots. Not wanting to seem like a pushover, I stood still and stared at the car. Not that I could actually see anything with the high beams almost blinding me. And after what seemed like a really long time, but must have not been more than 30 seconds, the car drove off. After that, I decided to park near the trucks from then on. A month or so passed, and nothing had happened since the car episode, and I figured that nothing more would if I just kept parking by the trucks. Then one night, I had a long 12-hour shift on a Sunday, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., and I didn't have time to eat dinner before work that day, and during the first half of my shift, I had to go back-to-back -back trips with no time to eat. So when I got to return to the home zone, I quickly parked in the far end of the almost empty truck stop, I got ready to eat my now very late dinner that my fiancé packed for me. I wanted to watch some TV on my phone while eating, so I sat with my back against the driver's side door and got comfy. While turning my back to the door, I had accidentally hit the door lock with my elbow, but that was my luck. As I was sitting there scrolling through Netflix on my phone, I suddenly felt the bus rock and heard the clack of the door handle behind me smack back in position. I quickly turned, and I saw a dude with a hood over his head, quickly crouching and proceeding to lay down on the ground and crawling under the bus, and he's got a big ass kitchen knife in his right hand. I quickly got up and made sure the other two doors were locked, and then I looked in all directions to see if I could spot him. He was still under the bus, and I was sure as hell not jumping out this time, since the knife made his intentions pretty clear. I turned on the engine turned on the spots on the back of the bus, and looked around to see if it had scared him off, and lucky for me, it did. I saw him run off into a bushy slash wooded area at the end of the truck stop, and I never parked at that truck stop ever again after that night, and I made sure all the doors were locked every time I was parked. The next story contains some details that might be triggering to some audiences. It includes a brief mention of ending one's life. It is used within the context of the story, but if this is something that might be disturbing to you, then please use the chapters feature to your discretion. Now here is the story. A couple of years ago and before the pandemic started, a friend of mine, Mary, introduced me to a guy. He wasn't really my type, 
but she's one of those people who turns into a matchmaker when she's in a relationship, so I agreed to go on a couple of dates with him so she wouldn't feel as worried that I might die alone and so on. The first time I met up with this guy, it was a group date with Mary, her boyfriend Tim, and another friend and her boyfriend. This guy Mary was trying to set me up with, Joe, seemed alright. We talked, traded jokes, that sort of thing. I was comfortable with him because I wasn't interested in him. At the end of the night, he asked me if he could meet up again sometime, and I agreed. Afterwards, I told Mary and she was delighted. Her boyfriend Tim, however, was not very happy. Tim's training to become a doctor. He's a very smart guy and my friends and I greatly value his opinion. There's something off about Joe, Tim said. I agreed, and Tim and I talked over a bit, but neither of us had seen or felt anything worse than a bit of weirdness. Be careful with Joe, Tim said, when I hugged my friends goodnight at the train station. Joe and I texted for a couple of weeks before we met up again, and those exchanges only cemented my first impressions. I just wasn't into him, and something about him was off. He began to reveal a side of himself that was less friendly, as well. He had very low self-esteem, and was always looking for reassurance. At first, that wasn't so bad, but it turned out to be toxic pretty quickly. He seemed to get off on that sort of attention. I didn't really want to go out with him again, but Mary was really invested in the idea of Joe and I getting together. Mary is a sweetheart, but she doesn't really have any instincts. Occasionally that gets me, or someone else in our friend group, into lots of trouble. Mary's cute, and everyone wants to make her happy. She has good intentions, but because she has no instincts, she can't sense danger, and sometimes drags people into dangerous situations. I was hoping this was not going to be one of those episodes. Anyway, Mary was excited about the next date, and Joe kept asking when I was going to meet up with him again, so I invited Joe to an event my hobby club was holding. I figured that that was going to be safe, because we'd be surrounded by people I knew very well. The evening was alright. Joe wasn't as creepy in person as he had been over text messages lately. After the event, we walked along the river for a bit on a walkway crowded with families and tourists. We eventually parted ways at a busy train station, and I figured I'd just gently push this thing further into the realm of platonic, and everything was going to be alright. Then, on one night a couple of weeks later, Joe called me and told me he was going to end his life. I freaked out and tried to calm him down. I stayed up all night talking to him, from when he called around 10pm until the sun rose. Every time he calmed down, I tried to say goodbye, but he kept saying that if I hung up, he was going to kill himself, so I stayed on the line, talking him down over and over again. Something about that situation just felt so wrong, but what else was I going to do? I didn't want to leave anyone to do that to themselves. As I sat on my patio, watching the sun rise over the forest behind my house, he finally let me off the hook. He said, thank you, and for a moment, I felt I'd done the right thing. Maybe I just saved a life. Then, Joe said, with a voice full of glee, that was the best night of my life, and hung up. I was stunned. What the hell? Had this psycho really kept me up all night, knowing full well the next day was going to be busy for me, just to get off on the attention? I decided there was no way in hell I was ever going to see this guy again. I told Mary what had happened and she was very apologetic. She agreed that Joe was a complete psycho, and said she was sorry that she had set me up with him, and told me to call the cops if he came to my house. I didn't think he would. Joe didn't have my address, and neither did the person that Mary had met him through. I don't give out my address to anyone but trustworthy family members, because I don't want my abusive ex-stepparent to find me. That precaution probably saved me from much worse of an experience. As it was, when I broke off with Joe, he took it pretty badly. He threatened to kill himself again, so I messaged Mary and she contacted her and Joe's mutual friend, who kept an eye on Joe for a few days. 
Not long after that, I started getting creepy phone calls after midnight. They were often at 2 or 3 in the morning. The caller never said anything, just breathed heavily down the line. It was so unnerving. I blocked the number every single time. Joe must have gone through four or five numbers before he switched his phone to a private number to get around caller ID. I couldn't block him anymore. I didn't know what to do. And for more than a year and a half, after Joe got a private number, I was forced to answer every one of his calls. The whole branch of my family have private numbers because one of them was scammed a little while ago. But luckily the police caught the scammer and they didn't end up losing any money. But unfortunately for me, that meant that if I received a call from a private number at night, I had to pick it up just in case something had happened to a member of my family. On one particular night, my phone went off at 3 a.m. It was a private number, and I knew it was most likely Joe. I was staring at my phone, trying to work out what to do. I never let the calls go to voicemail, because apart from the whole family issue, even if he didn't know where I lived, he certainly knew where Mary and Tim's houses were. I was afraid that if I didn't play along, he might go after my friends. The phone was still ringing. I reached out to swipe up and answer the call, and then paused. I had an idea. Back when I was in high school, my dad would sometimes call early in the morning. If no one else was in the house, I'd be woken up, stumble over to the phone half awake, and answer it with a slightly croaky voice. I have a low voice for a woman, so every time I answered the phone like that, my dad would mistake me for my brother John. I realized that I could use that, so I cleared my throat, dropped my voice as low as I could, and then said, Hello? I was delighted with the result. I sounded exactly like John. It was uncanny, for sure, but it made me a little bit sad, really, because John died about a year before I met Joe. It was a bit of a jolt, hearing something so close to his voice again after almost three years. I quickly grabbed my phone before it could ring out, tapped the answer button, and then said that deep, hello, again. This time there was no creepy breathing, only silence. I said another deep, hello. After a moment's pause, Joe hung up on me, and I was overjoyed. Every other time, I'd had hung up on him. No matter what I said before, he'd always wanted as much of my time as he could get. I let myself feel a little bit of flicker of hope. Maybe I was finally free. It has been over a year now, and it looks like I'm free of Joe. I haven't gotten any creepy calls since I pulled out my John impersonation, and I can only guess that Joe thinks I've changed my number or given it to someone else. Joe never met John, so when I said hello, he most likely just heard a young man's voice. If John were still here, I know he'd approve. If I could tell him now, he'd be very happy to know a part of him could still protect me, even so many years after he was gone. Anyway, I will most likely spend my life looking over my shoulder. Every time someone attacks the bins on my street, I worry that it might be Joe. Every time a beat-up car passes me as I walk to the bus stop or the train station, I worry it might be him. I have heard from mutual friends that Joe has said some awful things about me. He's told some people he slept with me, which he didn't, of course. Who would sleep with someone that creepy? Worse than that, Joe and Mary's mutual friend has said that Joe told her he wants to kill me. Needless to say, Mary and I were horrified with that statement. The friend has since told him I've moved to another city, so I think that might be enough. She's very close to him, distantly related, actually, so he believes what she tells him is true. When I'm done with my studies, I'm going to move across the country, but until then, I'm keeping my head down. My campus and Joe's are a 30-minute train ride apart. That's nowhere near far enough away, but it will have to do for now. There is one positive thing that has come out of this. Mary is now completely cured of any desire to play matchmaker. Oh yeah, and Joe? Let's never meet again.
This happened in the summer of 2010, when I was just entering my teenage years. My family took a trip to a really nice hotel in the city. I can't really remember why we decided to take the trip, but I remember a lot of family friends coming with and staying in adjacent rooms. I've never asked my parents, and it's not really important to the story. To preface, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat, and always have been. I'm a pretty skinny, fragile kid, so I get spooked pretty easily, even now. This, however, was almost definitely not me freaking myself out like I normally did. Looking back, I'm incredibly lucky I trusted my instincts. You see, this hotel had a strange design to it. The lobby was actually on the fourth floor, not the bottom floor, which I found strange. To access the lobby, you had to use the elevator. There was no way for you to get to it from the stairs. Now, this information would have been nice before everything happened, as you're going to find out. The hotel was organized in a square shape. Every floor was lined with a balcony, and you could look down into the lobby and cafe area from your floor. Essentially, if you were walking to your room, you could be seen from anyone that was on your floor, if they just stepped out of the room and looked around. I was always afraid I'd fall over the balcony and sail down eight stories to my death, but they were high enough to a point where I wasn't too concerned for my safety. For the first day or two was nice. My friends and I hung out and played cards all day, or we watched whatever was on TV. At night, we'd explore the halls of the hotel and tell each other ghost stories. It was a really fun time, even though I didn't fully understand why we were there. On the third day though, things got strange fast. I woke up to the sound of screaming coming from outside my door. Now, because of the hotel's design I mentioned, sounds from the lobby would echo all the way to the top of the building. So, when I walked outside to investigate, I immediately looked over the balcony to see what the commotion was about. I saw a girl laying on the ground, eggs and milk splattered everywhere around her. People were rushing to help her, and I heard a couple of people telling each other to call 911. It seemed like the girl was unconscious, maybe she passed out or something else. I scanned the lobby, and I saw that my family and a couple of my friends were in the lobby getting breakfast, all staring at the event in front of them. I decided I'd rush down to meet them to find out what had happened. The elevator was on the opposite side of my floor, so I took the stairwell located right next to my room. We were on the 7th or 8th floor, so I knew I only had to take about 4 flights down. Not a big deal. I descended for a little while, looking for the number 4 on the wall or the letter L. I passed floor 5, ready to find a door to the lobby. I took about two more flights of steps before realizing that there hadn't been a door for the fourth floor, nor had there been a door for the third or second. Now at this point, I probably should have turned back, but I continued down because I was tired and didn't want to climb back up. There were some weird side hallways that went into pitch black areas, with a bunch of piping and wiring, and though I was curious to explore, I passed them by. I quickly hit the bottom floor, a dimly lit and cold room with cinder block walls and concrete floors. In front of me was a set of double doors. I hesitated at first, but I assumed that this was just another way back to the lobby, so I opened them and entered. Behind the doors was a massive warehouse type room, probably the size of a smaller basketball stadium. The only light coming in was from the stairwell behind me, so I really wasn't able to see much. Stairs were stacked and covered in plastic wrap, tables lined the wall, and in the distance, I thought I could see boxes stacked and lined against the wall as well. I was probably in the storage room for the hotel, so I looked around and saw an elevator in the back of the room. I then made my way towards it. I closed the door to the stairwell, and I began to walk in the dim light. The room was super muggy and dusty, and it seemed like nobody had been down there in a very long time. As I got closer to the elevator, I noticed it was a little bit bigger than the elevators in the lobby and other floors. I pressed the up button, but got no response. There was a card swiper next to the button. Must have been for employees only, I thought. I turned back towards the stairwell doors, 
making my way past the chairs and tables along the wall. When I got to the door, I gave it a tug. Locked, of course. This is when things started to hit me, and I realized I was stuck in the dark, dusty basement of a hotel. I didn't have a phone either, because my parents wouldn't let me get one until I graduated middle school, so I couldn't call anyone at all. Everyone likely assumed I was still asleep in the room, so I began to freak out, believing that nobody was going to look for me. I searched around the warehouse, looking for other ways out. Some areas of the place were better lit than others, so I looked around in areas I could see first, before starting on the darker side of the room. There was another set of doors that I found, but it happened to be locked as well. I now began to cry, scared that nobody would ever find me in this basement. I swear, it felt like hours, but I think only a handful of minutes passed before I heard the door creak open. It wasn't the door from the stairwell. Rather, the second door I had found. A slim, middle-aged man in a lab coat came out of the doors. Now, if this was 21-year-old me seeing this man, I would be very confused as to why this guy was wearing a lab coat in a hotel. I was only 12 or 13 at the time, so I immediately was relieved at the sight of an adult who looked smart. I approached him, tears in my eyes, and he immediately looked surprised to see me, as you'd expect. What are you doing down here? He yelled. I got lost on my way down to the lobby, and I've been locked in here. Do you have a key? I was shaking, eager to get out of there. He didn't answer my key question, and instead he said, I know a way out of here. Follow me. He began to walk towards the door with a stairwell, and I followed, relieved that someone had finally come to save me. We now approached the doors, and I began to reach for the handle, but he continued walking. Isn't it right here? I asked him. I will never forget the look on his face when I said that. He looked nervous, and though it was dim, I could see sweat glistening from his forehead behind his glasses. No, this way, he said sternly. I continued to follow him, but I was now nervous myself. We had passed the door to the stairs and were now headed toward a darker side of the basement, away from the elevators. To be honest with you, he looked like he had no clue where he was leading me, as he kept checking around him, almost as if he was taking in his surroundings for the first time. We turned a corner and began walking towards the boxes, which was a dead end. I immediately froze, realizing that something was very, very wrong. This guy had no idea where he was going, nor did he appear to work at the hotel. I said, my voice shaking. Okay, where are we going? He turned and said, this way, just follow me. I knew that there were no doors by those boxes. I checked there first after I found out the stairwell door was locked. I want to thank whatever god is up there for gifting me with the idea that I had next. I started yelling, and as loud as I could. I yelled so loud I gave myself a headache. The man, irritated and plugging his ears, began yelling back at me and saying, What are you doing? Be quiet! I continued to yell. I don't even remember how long I was yelling for. But finally, the man snapped and began quickly walking towards me. I basically went in a full sprint towards the stairwell doors, hoping to God they'd somehow be magically open. He didn't run after me. He walked sternly behind me, and he was muttering a bunch of vulgarities at me. I was now about five feet from the door, and this was when somebody burst through. My savior, who was a hotel janitor, who had heard the screaming from the stairwell. He saw the situation, me and some random guy in a lab coat in a locked basement, and immediately told me to get behind him. The janitor asked me who the man was, and I said I had no idea. He had come in through the door on the other side of the room, and I pointed to the door. The janitor quickly radioed into the desk that he found a child in the basement, and quietly, so that I wouldn't hear, he said, This man came from outside. Get security, or something like that. The man in the lab coat started trying to argue with the janitor, claiming that he simply was looking for a bathroom. 
The janitor clearly wasn't buying it and kept saying things like, wait until security gets here and talk to them about it. I was standing beside him the whole time, trying to take in what was happening, confused out of my mind. Eventually, an employee from the front desk arrived and took me back up the steps to the lobby, where I met with my family, who surprisingly had no idea I was missing. I told them the story, crying and shaking, and they hugged me tightly, thanking the employee over and over again for their help. I never got to thank that janitor though. Looking back now, I have absolutely no clue what that man was doing in the basement. I don't have any more information as to what happened afterwards, or who he was. I know for a fact that the incident with the girl in the lobby was unrelated. Something about low blood sugar. I'm not sure. I've thought about that day a lot. The only explanation I can put together is that the door I had found in the basement led to the streets of the city where he must have wandered in from. I have no clue what his intentions were, why he was wearing a lab coat, or why he chose to pretend to know a way out. To be frank, this could have just been a huge misunderstanding of some sort, and I just chose a really bad time to get lost. But all I know for sure is if I hadn't screamed my lungs out, I might not have been telling this story the same way, or at all. So strange man in a lab coat wandering around a dark, dusty hotel basement. Let's not meet. These events happened over several months in 2016, when me and my sister, then 16 and 14, first moved into our most recent apartment complex with our mother. We now call it the apartment complex from hell because there were many incidents there. Admittedly, we were still into the hoverboard craze then, and we would ride them around. This is how we met Savannah. She was our age and lived in our building. She asked to hang out, and we were happy to hopefully make new friends, so we said yes. We hung out outside the complex at a little park area. It got dark, and we started making up ghost stories. Turns out that she liked creepy paranormal stuff like we did. Note, I did not actually believe in this stuff, and still don't. Every time I reference the paranormal, it's a hyperbole. As we were walking home, the light in one of the apartment hallways flickered, and I joked and said it was a spirit trying to communicate with us. Savannah made up a flash once for yes, twice for no system to communicate with the spirit, and we messed around a little bit. We thought it was just harmless fun. The next day, she runs over to us, excited. She informs us that the spirit we had spoken to last night told her its name was Kiran, and that it meant light, so it all made sense. We asked her how she knew, and she said she went back later that night, alone, to talk to it. This was the first time it occurred to us that she might have really believed in this stuff. Our aunt had given us an old Ouija board as a joke the year before, and we thought Savannah might like it. Savannah lit up and said she wanted to try and talk to Kiran, so we huddled in the hallway connecting the apartments and put our hands on the board. We kept getting random letters and didn't make sense, but soon Savannah's questions were directed to Kiran. We felt her moving the planchette and called her out, but she got mad and said she'd prove it. She took her hand off the planchette and no longer moved. She huffed and insisted it wasn't her, and over the next few weeks, we did mostly normal stuff with her, but she kept talking about the ghosts and Ouija boards until we broke down and played it again. This time, we were introduced to a new ghost, Evan. We knew it was Savannah moving the planchette, but were curious about the story she was making, so we'll let her follow through. Evan was a ghost, or demon rather, about our age who wanted free from a greater demon controlling him. The greater demon's name was Kiran. Savannah's parents called her inside, and conveniently, Evan had to go too. He told us he'd protect us against Kiran, especially Savannah. Savannah commented on how cute that was for him to offer. A few days go by normally, but then Savannah's back to tell us she has a boyfriend. We are happy for her, but that's until she tells us his name is Evan. We're wondering what the hell she's talking about, and she explains that while sleeping over at another friend's house, 
Something had tugged off her shorts while she slept. She woken up and heard Evan's voice. Then he visited her in her dreams and asked a date or something like that. She said yes. Of course, we know she made up Evan so we're kind of like, what is wrong with you? And we don't talk about the demon stuff anymore. Now Savannah was extremely possessive over her friends. When she'd see us with someone else, she'd text us non-stop about why we hadn't invited her. We tried to keep our distance, but she lived on the ground floor and literally watched out her window waiting for us to come outside. She latched onto us. We didn't know much about her home life, but she always seemed troubled. She had scars on her wrists and talked about running away from her home. Her parents, though, seemed alright, if rather strict and religious. However, we still hung out with her because we were worried, but were starting to feel weird about it. Even worse, she'd randomly show up holding her hand out, saying Evan was holding her hand. Savannah would look at random things and laugh when nobody was talking because Evan had told her a joke. Once, she made us feel her cheek where it was supposedly warm from Evan kissing her, but it was not warm. One day, my sister and I were bored from her talking to Evan on the Ouija board. She was still controlling the whole thing and wanted some fun. I texted my mom to call my phone from a blocked number and play creepy sounds. Looking back, this was one of the dumbest things I did, but at the time, it was just for fun. My mom made the call and I put it on speaker. Savannah is living for it, especially when my mom played a track from a scary movie about a ghost. My mom took it a step further and threw a banana off our third story balcony for us to see. Savannah said it was a sign that Kiran was winning, but we had no idea of the fire that this would light in her. We were about to tell her it was a prank, but again her mom called her inside. She found us again the next day, and I came clean about the prank. She laughed and said that there was no way we could have done that. I said no, my mom literally did all of it. Well, Savannah had told her friend about it, who told her that yellow objects, like the banana, were a sign of the devil and seeing them meant the devil was hunting you. This was all she talked about for a while, but since nothing else happened, she gradually forgot. Things then went back to normal for a while, until Autumn moved in. Autumn and Savannah connected instantly because of their history with depression. Autumn was a few years younger than us, but had a hell of a lot more of a past. This included significant time spent in a psychiatric facility and violence toward her classmates and family. Autumn claimed she heard demons talk to her at night, and just like that, the ghost stuff had started again. Savannah felt threatened by Autumn and felt the need to one-up her with ghost stuff. She told her Evan was her ghost brother that looked out for her. I was like, hold on, you claimed he was your boyfriend. She giggled and said, that's gross, he's my brother. Her story had completely switched. Now she was dating another demon named Jacob and they were engaged. She even showed us a ring to prove it. The next week or so was literally a match between them to see who was the darkest and the most involved in the spiritual world or whatever. They'd compare scars on their wrists and brag about cutting themselves and doing things like sneaking out in the night. In a move to one-up Autumn, Savannah drew a giant pentagram in the parking lot with chalk. Her parents found out about this and she backed out and blamed it on Autumn. The next day, people come to repave the parking lot the pentagram is now buried under it forever, literally. Savannah moved on to say her friend had found Jacob's body and was going to put his spirit back inside it. Savannah continued to take advice from this friend, who fueled everything she said. Savannah now said the friend was teaching her witchcraft. We mostly avoided her at this point, but she'd ask us to do things like make holy water with her and try to summon her a familiar. From that point on, she insisted she was a fire witch and walked around wearing all black with Halloween-like makeup on her face. She and Autumn frequently snuck out together and occasionally we'd see a cop car at her house. My sister and I were avoiding them both, but now we'd get fiery text messages from both of them if we hung out with other people. 
especially with our male friends. Once they saw us get home and stood in the parking lot pretending to be possessed, Autumn also cut off all her hair and claimed to have tried to kill her teacher. My sister and I knew it was BS, or at least we hoped, but Savannah took it so seriously. She'd go around telling neighbors of terrible crimes she committed or wanted to commit. She even told us that when she'd first seen us outside with hoverboards, that she wished for them to blow up. One day, we again saw the police come to her door, and the officers had jackets that said that they were from the juvenile justice department. Her mom pulled me, my sister, and our mom aside to explain what was going on. Apparently, two years before this, they discovered Savannah talking with a man online. Her messages to him were hiring him to come literally kill her parents after making threats of killing them a few days before. We were able to confirm the story after pet sitting for them and finding court papers about it. We'd known she was on probation, but she'd always tell us different stories as to why. Savannah continued to beg us to hang out with her after that, even inviting herself to spend the night. We avoided her at all costs, but she followed us everywhere. It kind of died down when Autumn moved out, and Savannah moved with her family shortly after. Since then, she started doing service hours at a horse stable and graduated high school. I just really hope she's gotten happier and more stable. Autumn messaged my sister a few months ago, asking to call her mom to confirm she was with us. She wasn't, and we later saw her with a 19-year-old dude. She's 14 now. Me and my sister and mom have moved out as well. There were just too many incidents in those apartments. Our new place is so quiet, and it's very peaceful too. But anyway, to Savannah and to Autumn, let's never meet again. Being from a rather small town, I grew up running around the neighborhood with other kids and not worrying about anyone on the streets. My parents knew all the other people in the neighborhood, and most of them were about 80 anyway. I was plagued by sweet grannies, and their love of overfeeding random children they could find on the street. My life was tough. I was around 6 at the time of this story, and I haven't really talked much about it, although I feel like it's a good fit for our let's not meet, and I think there comes a time where sharing is good for you. My house was at the corner of the two residential streets and one house away from a gas station. One night, my dad and I decided to watch MST3K for the night, but we needed to get some snacks. He had to clean up after dinner, so he asked my half-brother to walk me to the gas station, something we always used to do, to get supplies. My brother and I don't really get along whatsoever, never have, and never truly will. In the loving way that older siblings give in and put up with you, my brother agreed to go with me, but when we reached the point where our yard touches the street, he told me that he'd stand there and watch since you could see straight across to the store. All I had to do was just run there and run back. I told him I'd tell, but he said he would give me another dollar to get a second candy bar if I shut up. So what can I say? My loyalty was easily bought as a young child, so I trekked across the yard for the house across the street and walked on across the alley to the beginning of the parking lot. I couldn't see anyone outside until I got closer. The corner closest to the houses has a wooden fence with a broken door on front. Recent to the story, they had taken it off and laid it to the side of where it should have been so you could see the dumpsters and everything inside the area. I walked right by that way and up the lip of the cement step to the walkway that went to the door. As I did so, I noticed there was a guy sitting on the ground resting against a bicycle. I didn't think anything of it other than he must have been weird to sit around dumpsters. I went inside as per usual. Muscular dude was behind the counter as he was every single weekend. He made a comment about not having my dad, and I told him about my night while he walked me around the store and helped me get everything that we normally got. He then rang it up, and I handed him the money I had. 
I remember how quickly his attitude changed. He watched out the door and said something I didn't understand. I just stood there, looking out the glass doors, and trying to see what he was upset about, but I couldn't see what was going on. He asked me if there had been a guy by the dumpsters, and I told them that I'd seen the gross guy over there on my way in. I walked by him. The gas station clerk told me that he would walk me out the door, but I said I'd be fine because my brother could see me down the street. He agreed to walk me to the edge of the lights, if I promised to run quickly to my house straight across, and he'd watch me do so. I got to the edge of the lights, and I reached the dim area where there was the alleyway. As soon as I was in the middle of it, properly away from the gas station, I felt something weird. I heard a sniffing sound like a dog, and I froze. The attendant screamed for me to run, and I heard someone say something about a good-smelling little girl before I booked it. After I came home, I started crying and told my dad, and he drove us over there and talked to the gas station guy, who said he'd help file a police report over the whole thing. My dad walked me to the car, but the guy showed up with a bicycle again. My dad was already inside, and I was getting into the car while the guy rode by and grabbed me by my hair and pulled me backwards. I hit the concrete pretty hard, but I had my hands on it luckily. Seconds later, he let go of me when the attendant came out with a baseball bat and started swinging. My dad loaded me up and took me to the PD, where they told us that he was Bill, a guy who was known to be schizophrenic and hanging out around town. And they could never find him and never had reasons to arrest him, but they let someone know about it for sure. I never saw the weird guy in his bicycle ever again, but I still think about it when I'm outside at night or near a gas station. Let's not meet again, Bill. I grew up on a dead-end road where all five of my neighbors were relatives. I liked to go to my aunt's house behind us, which I could get to one of two ways. I could cut through the pasture separating our properties, or I could walk around on the road that ran beside the field and had woods on the other side. I usually cut through the pasture, but the year before I had walked through a tick nest and got at least a hundred ticks all over my pants. But luckily my mom saw them and made me strip them off outside. So that is why I chose to take the road. To me, at age 9, the road was creepy. It just felt like I was in the middle of nowhere, and if something happened, then no one would be nearby to help me. This was in the 70s, so obviously no cell phones. One day, I went to visit my aunt for a few hours. As I was walking back, I was freaked out as usual but really not expecting anything to actually happen. When I was about 40 yards from my house, this part of the road was on a curve so I couldn't see my house yet. I heard a man whisper from the woods, There's a little girl. My hair stood on end. I screamed and ran as fast as I could, screaming the entire way. Luckily, my dad was at the bottom of the driveway working on something, and he met me in the road in a panic since I was basically screaming bloody murder. I told him what I'd heard, so he ran around the curve and was gone for about 20 minutes. When he came back, he marched inside and called the police. He said someone had been doing drugs in the woods, and he found evidence that they had been hanging out there a lot. The police came and searched around quite a bit, but nobody was ever found, and they never came back. Needless to say, whoever was watching from the woods. Let's not meet. I'm from a small town, the kind where you're in the same class with the same kids from preschool all the way through graduation. I was never popular and had my fair share of bullies, but never as bad as one kid in my class, Max. He was on the shorter side and had these little round glasses with his hair slicked to the side, like he was straight out of a movie, cast as the stereotypical nerd. He kept to himself and didn't really interact with others, if he could avoid it. Fast forward to the 8th grade, when we were paired as lab partners, and had to sit at the same table together every day, for the entire year. I considered myself a nice person, 
and always went out of my way to make sure I wasn't being rude to people, especially people who hadn't done anything to deserve it. So of course, I was friendly and happy to be his partner as long as he did his fair share of the work. The year came and went. He was shy but polite, and we got along fine being partners. Ninth grade started, and I had a lot of troubles at home with my birth father, so I chose to move in with my mother a few towns over. I was only about 30 minutes away, but I had to start a completely new school a month into my freshman year, and it was scary. I may not have been popular at my last school, but I did have several friends whom I loved and missed dearly. My mom would often drive me to the other town to see my friends and hang out, and I also started making new friends at my new school. It was a good setup, and I continued this way until I was 16 and could drive myself. I never heard anything from Max, and honestly, I had kind of forgotten about him. That was until my junior year of high school. I casually started to see this other guy, Jack, from my hometown, and he asked me to go to prom with him. I was excited and happy to say yes, as I would get to spend the night with him and my friends from my childhood. A couple of months before prom, my mother told me there was a new lady at her job, and she was asking about me because her grandson was seeing me, and she wanted a picture so that she could put a face to my name. My mother knew Jack and knew this wasn't his grandmother, so she asked his name, and wouldn't you know it, it was Max. My mother showed her a picture of me that she had on her desk, and the lady went on her way. A few weeks later, she asked for the color of my prom dress, so that she knew what to get Max so that we matched. My mother was confused, but told her it was pink. About two weeks before prom, some of my friends from my hometown told me that Max had been telling some people that we were going to the dance together and that he was so excited. I thought this was creepy, but I didn't put too much thought into it. The night of prom, I picked Jack up, and we headed over to the school, only to find Max and his grandmother waiting outside the entrance so that she could take pictures of us before we go in. I was not one to disappoint people. So I politely took a couple of pictures with him, as my actual date stood off to the side and waited. If Max's grandmother was confused that I had another date, she didn't show it. The rest of the night went smoothly, and Jack and I had a great time. We didn't see Max anymore, and I assumed he had left. Other than his grandmother telling my mom that he lost my number and trying to get it for him, which she thankfully didn't do so, I didn't hear much from him until we graduated. I went to a state college and had heard that he had gotten into a well-respected private university. Everything was fine for the first few weeks of college, and then I ran into him. He caught me on the way to class one day. I was polite and asked him if he was a student here too, which he was, and I chatted with him for a minute before hurrying off to class. It was a relatively harmless interaction but still creeped me out a bit since I knew he got into that other school and wondered why he had chosen to go to a state college. For the next few months, I ran into him almost daily. He always wanted to talk and never seemed to be with anyone else. I found out from some other girls in my dorm that he had been hanging around asking about me and trying to figure out my class schedule and where I would be and when. He also told them that he was my boyfriend and he had passed up a scholarship to another college to come here and be with me instead. They figured out he was lying when they never saw us together for long periods or him up in the rooms with me and stopped answering his questions. I left at the end of the semester to move home and take classes at a nearby school. I did not tell him, obviously. The following year I got married to my boyfriend from my senior year of high school Dumb, I know. Anyway, we were in his small town, which is the same county as my hometown, for a fair shortly after the wedding. While we were walking around and enjoying ourselves at the fair, I see Max staring at us at the end of the block. It was the first time I'd been genuinely fearful of him, as the look on his face was nothing short of hatred. I tried to ignore him and went about my night, seeing him a few more times always with that same look on his face. The next years passed, with me hearing nothing from him at all. I didn't know if he had still lived around the area or not, 
I found out a little while after that that he did when I started working at a clothing store in town and he would stop in and sit at the dad chair next to the door for all the guys to hang out at while their people shopped. I mentioned it to my manager because of our history and the fact that he would stare at me constantly while sitting there, but he always came in with a girl. I later found out it was his sister, so they didn't think too much of it. He never spoke to me again, just stared. When I was in my mid-twenties, I moved to a city in my hometown, but still several hours away from my small town. I am 30 years old now and doing well in life. Other than a random Facebook friend request, which I rejected, I haven't heard from him again, and I hope that it stays that way. A few years ago on Quora, I answered the question of, have you ever met someone for the first time and gotten the strongest feeling that person was bad? Reading through the subreddit had me thinking back to that question, so I figured I'd share my story. Years back, I made a late night stop at a local Walmart on my way home from a friend's house. It was in a quiet area, not a lot of people out and about at nearly 1am. I lived around there for years and never ran into any truly criminal elements there, so I felt safe going to the store alone as a woman in my early 20s. I made eye contact with a teenage girl the second I walked in the door. She was parked on a bench by the restrooms, hugging a backpack and a small purse checking her phone with a rather desperate expression on her face. When she looked at me, I could tell that she was on the verge of panicking. After a brief second of staring at me, she went back to checking her phone and making phone calls. At the other end of the bench was a white-haired man in jeans and a t-shirt. If I had a guess, he was probably in his late 50s or early 60s. Altogether, nothing appeared off about him, but what struck me was the fact that he never looked up as I passed him. Instead, his eyes were absolutely glued to the teenage girl next to him, and not in a passive way, but like he was sizing her up for something. She was perched on the edge of the bench, angling herself away from his gaze, and leaning away from him. Her body language screamed that she wanted nothing to do with him. Something about him set off warning bells in my head as I went about grabbing the items I'd stumped for. I'm normally the type of person that mills about this door aimlessly, making a point to wander each aisle just to see what's for sale. That night, however, I felt a pressing need to get in and out of the store as quick as possible, and something in the back of my head told me to keep an eye on the man on the front bench. I moved my knife from my purse to the front pocket of my jeans, where it could be easily accessible. That's how uneasy I felt being in the same building as this man. As I purchased my items, I watched the pair on the front bench, the man had moved halfway across the space between them and was trying to chat with a young woman. She was shaking her head and offering one-word answers, looking like a rabbit about to bolt. As I walked past them again to leave with my purchases, she stopped me and asked if I was headed anywhere close to my old hometown. Apparently, she'd been on her way home from a trip with friends, and they made a stop to grab drinks and use the restroom. She got in separated from the group and they left her at the store. The store was about a 30 minute drive from my old hometown, and I knew to get home she'd have to walk several hours along unlit stretches of rural highway. The man sitting next to her continued to leer at her, but refused to look my way. While I would normally have told the girl that I was heading the opposite direction, something in the back of my head told me not to leave her alone with this man. I agreed to take her home, and she thanked me profusely and offered gas money and a cigarette. I refused both and took her home, the logical part of my brain reasoning that the girl weighed maybe about 100 pounds and was a full head shorter than I was, so if it came down to it, I could fight her off. I wasn't stupid either. I texted a few friends to let them know what I was doing, and they were not happy with me. The girl mentioned her address, and I knew exactly where she was talking about. It was an old, quiet neighborhood where I used to play Little League Baseball down the street and swim in the pool a few blocks away. During the drive, she told me that she just moved to the area with her mom and younger sisters from a larger city several hours south. She'd taken off with a few of her old friends for the weekend, 
and her mom hadn't expected her back until the following day, so she'd silenced her phone for the night and I hadn't picked up when the girl tried to call. Edit. I vaguely remember something about her mom having to work early in the morning, and none of the girl's sisters were old enough to have their own phones. Anyway, we arrived at the destination, and the girl gave me a handshake and thanked me repeatedly, asking if there was anything she could do to repay me. I told her, yeah, do me a favor, get better friends. Looking back, I have no idea what about the man creeped me out so much, but something about him and the way he was staring at the girl got me hackles up. I had thought in passing that I might have been waiting for someone else in the store, perhaps someone using the nearby restroom, but upon checking out, it struck me that I hadn't seen any other customers there, so we really had no reason to be waiting on that bench. I was still living with my parents at the time, so when I got home, I woke up my mom and told her what happened. She hesitated, and I could see that she didn't like the idea of me giving a stranger a ride home, but in the end she agreed that something had prompted me to take action, and that might have saved that young girl from being harassed, or worse. Edit 12-4-2020 Oh wow, I wasn't expecting this to get a lot of attention, and it has. Thank you for all the upvotes and awards, my friends. As for all the comments about being proud of me for doing what I did, Thanks guys. I don't advise people to pick up random strangers and give them rides, but if your gut is saying something's wrong, pause to assess the situation and try to work out why, then be smart about your response. My dad read the post and said he wished I'd contacted him or the police department so they could help the girl, and I probably should have done that. Either way, stay safe out there everyone. I was around 9 to 10 years old when this happened, but I remember clearly pretty much everything that took place. This was at school. It was lunch break, which lasted about 2 hours. I was with a group of friends, and we were playing like pretty much everyone else, but we started to notice people in front of the school, and when I mean people, I mean around 20. Usually there wasn't anyone, or they were just walking by. They all had their phone out in their hands. A woman approached the entry of the school and she just started taking pictures of every kid she saw. We could tell because there was flash. An adult of the school went to see her and told her to knock it off. But instead she just kind of smiled terrifyingly at him and said something that I didn't hear. But it looked kind of like when a mother comforts you. A sort of, it's going to be okay. So he started to get mad because taking pictures of children like that is weird as hell. Eventually she went away, but that didn't really change anything if you want my opinion, because everyone else in front of the school was taking pictures of us. Everyone, literally. I especially remember a guy that was pretending to call, except that he didn't talk, and he also had his flash on, so we quickly understood that he was taking pictures. Us kids thought it was fun, and a sort of game so we started playing hide and seek with them, being like, ah, the flash is going to get me and I'm going to die, or stupidities like that. But we really started to understand that there was a real problem. When one of them tried to open the entry, that was kind of useless since the barriers weren't even high enough, so if he wanted to do so, he could just climb up a little bit. And that's when the headmaster got totally mad and went to see everyone. She yelled at them for about 10 minutes, called the police, and when she calmed down, she asked them to explain why they were doing that. The headmaster told us herself that all these people pretended to be sort of voodoos and that they could sell pictures of us, make us suffer, etc. To be honest, everyone mostly laughed, but the adults didn't really seem too amused by it. To this day, I don't know if what she said was true. I don't know if some people were arrested. I don't know what became of those pictures. The thing I remember the most is just that woman's smile. That's what absolutely creeped me out. Today, I'm scared of being taken in photos even by friends, and when it's family members or very close friends, I'm still just very uncomfortable. Like every good story, there is a beginning, 
and an ending. This roller coaster of a story is still ongoing two years later, with no end in sight. It all started when I wanted to further my education and got a bachelor's in information systems. To give a little bit about myself, to help paint the picture, I'm 26, 4 foot 8, female. I get called gel bait often because I look way younger than I am. During the beginning of my studies, my current boyfriend and I had broken up, so I told myself it would be best to stay single until I finished school. I took to the internet after my breakup, as most do, just looking for company. I'd found this one group on Facebook where I felt like I belonged. I got along well with everyone, and I loved to flirt in this group. That's where I met him. Let's call him Kemper. Like many others before him, I latched my claws into him and began flirting. I even had a little crush on him. Things began innocently. I flirted and he flirted back on the group. He seemed very mysterious though. I guess that's what drew me to him. He didn't have a profile picture, not of him at least, and he never told me his age or what he looked like. After a few weeks of flirting, a woman in the group that we were both in had mentioned that it was his birthday. I knew I wanted to do something for him, but I was pretty limited on what I could do. Now, before I get hell for this, just know I've never sent an unsolicited topless picture to another man, not until that day at least. On the picture, I wrote happy birthday, insert his name, and press the send button on messenger. Just that split second decision has changed my life for the past two years. It's so easy looking back and thinking what could have been done differently, but there's no going back now. Within a week of talking non-stop to Kemper, he was already telling me that he loved me. He was working as a truck driver, but at the time he had broken his knee at work. So he was at a commission for a few months, which allowed him to talk to me as much as possible. During this time, I was working as a delivery driver with DoorDash. It was easier for me to make my own schedule since I wasn't done with school just yet. The first few months were great. We would talk constantly over the phone and through messenger. Also, let me point out quickly that this was a long distance relationship between Kemper and myself. So, I remember the first fight that we ever had. Hell, even before then I could see the red flag slapping me in the face at every turn. However, our first fight was because I was texting him while driving. He flipped his lid and totally went crazy on me. It was very unexpected, and it made me cry. I can't tell you how many times I tried to apologize and tell him it wouldn't happen again. After the incident, I was blown away how easily something so little, or at least I thought it was little, would make him do a complete 180. Months go by and the fights continue on, more frequently. One point, he had mentioned how cool it would be to have an app where we could see each other's location. In my naive and love state mind, I did some quick search and found an app called Life360. We both downloaded the app, and now, he could see everywhere that I go. At first it was a neat idea to say the least, to follow him around everywhere he went, to feel closer and more connected to him. That's what I used it for. He however wanted to use it for different reasons. I learned over time how controlling, manipulative, and how damn right psychotic he was. We would argue about things, and even when I get mad, he would somehow turn things around on me and make me feel like I'm the bad guy. The first time we broke up, it was a crazy show for sure. He had broken up with me on the group we were both in, just because I'd flirted with another guy, and he didn't like it. He was telling the other guys in the group how much of a whore I was, and how they could have me. He even threatened to give out my address to the guys in the group so they can come to my house. And, well, I'm sure you get the idea. My friend, let's call him Aussie. For the sake of the story, he was a member of the group, and he could tell how upset I was in the group comments, and he messaged me personally for the first time. Now let me tell you, I don't know what it is, but seems like I attract monsters. Monster is the best way to describe Kemper and Aussie. They are both well-off men, 
of the world at their fingertips. I guess that's part of the controlling bits or showing aggression when they don't get their way about things. Now, before I go into more details about Aussie, I just want to recount a few incidents with Kemper to give the readers a better understanding of what kind of man he is and how dumb I am letting things continue the way they have. One incident happened months ago. He and I were fighting, seemingly over nothing, and I was driving home from a long day at work and school as well, and Kemper just blurts out, I wish you could just run off the road and into a ditch and die. I was speechless. The tears welled up in my eyes and the driving became harder because I couldn't see, so he almost got his wish. I had to stop at the Dollar General in my town to compose myself. I couldn't breathe. I was wheezing. The man I thought I loved was wishing I would die. If he hated me that much, why is he keeping me around? I just wanted to curl into a ball at that moment and just disappear for a while. I didn't want to go home, but I couldn't just stay parked at a Dollar General. I was really at a loss for what to do. It wasn't until a while later where I told my mom and dad what he said. They were already getting their pitchforks ready, wanting to reenact the Salem witch trials because of him, and ever since, they haven't liked him. Another incident. He and I were talking about meeting, and he told me that he would need the menopause act in place. Yeah, he made that up, but basically he doesn't want to have sex in the off chance we get pregnant. He told me that if I ever did get pregnant, it would make me have a maternity test to see if it's his, and then he would make me abort the child. He doesn't want kids, but I do, so of course I was really upset, and he made me cry yet again. Making me cry is a common occurrence with him over the last two years. One night, another fight breaks out, and he loves to drink beer. He loves to hurt me even more by saying that beer is his best friend, and beer would never disappoint him like I do. During this late night phone call, he was extremely drunk, and he was threatening to kill himself. I just couldn't take the arguing, so I bid him a good evening, and let that be that and I hung up on him. I received a large number of text messages saying all sorts of things, but one really stood out to me. He wrote, If I kill myself tonight, it'll be because you made me do it. I didn't see these until the next morning, but you can imagine how panicked I was. My heart just sank, and of course tears started going down my eyes. He's good at making me feel like crap, good at manipulating, lying, controlling, it's just all becoming way too much. It's really more than anyone should deal with, no matter how much you love someone. The next day, I begged him to get help for his drinking, his depression, and wanting to end his life, but he just refuses. Being so far away, there's only so much I can do. Kemper has anger issues along with so many other issues as well. I know I'm not perfect, but at least I don't act like he does. I'm very friendly and I get along with almost everyone. I guess that's just part of his problem with me. We are complete opposites when it comes to that. During our time together, I had gotten two other jobs at different times besides the DoorDash gig, just part time though. Notice I said I had gotten two jobs? Well, the first one was at Walgreens. The very first day on the job, I was doing certifications for the job and during the whole time, he was blowing up my phone, telling me I don't need another job, or telling me that I won't have time for him, or that he would need to find someone else to replace the time I spent with him while also keeping me around. I just couldn't take it, so I quit. Fast forward a few months later, I get another job. This one was at Dollar General, just at the town over. I did work there more than a day, but his bitching and nagging ultimately made me quit that job as well. I just recently had a talk with him about graduating soon and I will find a job at a hospital working normal hours with a better pay. Well, he didn't like that too much. He found some reason to be mad at me and start a fight and he has gotten in the habit of ignoring me for a day or two. He's even ignored me for a whole week and honestly, that was the most peace I'd gotten in quite some time. Honestly, things have just drastically gone downhill and quick. He tells me all the time now he doesn't trust me because I wanted to go on a date with a cop. 
This was some guy I met at the gas station down from where I lived and gave him my Snapchat. He seemed friendly and I was curious what kind of pictures he would post on Snapchat or send me. When the cop sent me a picture of his private parts, that's when he was blocked. And yes, I told Kemper about this. This incident with a cop had happened on one of the many times Kemper and I had broken up. I do respect him, as weird as that is to say. I would never go on another date with another man or flirt with another guy. I'm very friendly and I guess some guys take that the wrong way. Now Kemper tells me all the time I need to build trust because the incident with a cop had caused him to have trust issues. I even had a work colleague, yes a guy, that works at a Mexican restaurant and he offers free food and boy do I love me some Mexican food. I see this guy quite frequently and talk to him when I see him because I pick up DoorDash orders from where he works. This guy has asked me out quite often, but I turn him down every single time. So he asked me if I would like free Mexican food and we could just hang out at the restaurant and eat and talk as friends. I guess I really am naive because I learned later on this guy had a crush on me. How did I find out he had a crush on me you ask? Well I was talking to him one day, maybe about a week after he offered me free food and just to hang, and he began to get extremely close to me and kissed me on the lips, at the restaurant, where customers were sitting around us eating. I jerked my head back and told him how inappropriate that was, and reminded him that I did in fact have a boyfriend, which he knew from the very beginning. I just don't understand men sometimes. I know how bad it seems, and you're probably thinking that Camper has every right to have trust issues, but I respect him in every way possible, and every time in certain situations like this happens, I handle it the best way I know. I didn't want to make a scene however when the waiter at the Mexican restaurant kissed me. I guess I'm too nice for my own good. Now in each fight that Kemper and I have, he always tells me how much of a whore I am or asks if I do OnlyFans. He even told me the reason why I deleted the Life360, the tracking app. It's because I'm going off at night with other men and eating their buttholes. His words, not mine. But no, the reason why I deleted the Life360 app is because I needed to gain some of the control back and some of my privacy back as well. As of right now, Kemper and I will have the chance to meet this coming January 2023, although I'm not really sure about it. Two years of up and downs and him having my heart and ripping out when it's convenient for him has me thinking it might not be the best idea. Also, it might be the fact that he has told me of his violent past with his ex-girlfriend. This happened many years ago, but it scares me knowing that he can be this violent. What had happened was, his girlfriend at the time was putting on makeup. He hates makeup, and they got into an altercation with him blacking out and him pinning her down to the bed and choking her. He didn't even realize what he was doing until he came to. He's told me lately that if he ever caught me in his bed with another man, he would punch me in the face, not the guy, simply because the man didn't know better, and I did. I've spent a lot of time and effort into this relationship and wanting to work it out in the end, but honestly not sure if meeting would be the best thing to do, now or ever. So let's talk about Aussie. He's a tad bit older than me. He's 49 years old while Kemper is 48 years old. You would think they would be mature for their age. Well, Aussie is very mature. Kemper, not so much. Aussie and I began talking the first time Kemper and I had broken up. He was being a concerned friend and messaged me asking me what was going on. I spelled everything to him. He was like a best friend I didn't know I had. He was so easy to talk to and he even began opening up to me about his troubled upbringing. We would talk about everything and things began to escalate into a more sexual topic. He would tell me about his dark fantasies, which at one point I would have shared with him, but not so much anymore. I'm more vanilla nowadays when it comes to stuff like that. After a month or so of talking, he too would begin to tell me he loved me as well, but only as a friend. I knew better than that, and it made me uncomfortable knowing that someone I've only had a handful of conversations with mostly consisted of sex talk, would tell me how much he loved me. The majority of the time, we would just exchange gifts with a few voice clips shared between us. 
Over time, I felt bad for talking to this man, but he was a comfort when Kemper and I had broken up, but our conversations went from semi-normal to just weird. Let me mention real quick, just like Kemper, he too didn't have a profile picture, but he would post pictures of himself on the group, so I knew what he looked like, and he was a very handsome man. After a while of talking to him, he would send me some other pictures, which seemed to be newer pictures, which looked nothing like the pictures he had posted in the group, but I didn't make a fuss out of it, I just assumed that pictures in the group were older pictures. One day he told me he was getting a haircut. I was trying to be polite and asked for a picture to see the new haircut. Days later, he finally sent me that picture, and I wasn't sure who this person in the picture was. It looked absolutely nothing like the previous pictures he had sent. At that moment, I assumed that I was being catfished, but it didn't matter to me because looks really don't matter. A lot of the messages I received from him is how he wants to breed me. He refers to himself as Mr. Wolf and tells me all the time how he wants to marry me and steal me away from Kemper and get me pregnant. He talks all the time about how we would make a beautiful child and how he's very well off so we would be able to have more children and how much of a great life that we would have. He even goes out of his way to find gifts and pictures of naked pregnant women being forced into brutal things. Things tend to get even darker at times. He has told me that he wants to have his way with me in front of Kemper, all the while he's tied to a chair and then have his way with Kemper next. Over time, he was talking about some women in the Facebook group that we were in, and just women in general, who would cheat on their husband and flirt with other men behind their husband's back. He would say how these women need to be taken care of. Not the exact word he used, but I hope you get where I'm going with that. He tells me all the time how he knows high-end people and he's good friends with the governor and that he can find any kind of information about someone if he needs to. It's truly scary to say the least if this is all true and my gut feeling is telling me that it is. It's just one of the many reasons I began distancing myself from him. He is in the process of having a lawsuit settled, in which he would gain a large amount of money from it, which he really doesn't need. One day he began sending me pictures of this piece of property, with a large multi-million dollar home on with a cellar. He would tell me how he would convert the cellar into a dungeon and keep me there as his play toy. The more I write about things, the more I'm getting a better idea of how dangerous things could have possibly have been if I ever met either Kemper or Ossie. Ossie tells me all the time about his lawsuit and when it should be finished and tells me he would love to take my mom and myself to dinner. I talk about my mom quite often to him because she plays a big part in my life and I love her more than anything. So I live in the south by the gulf and Ossie has friends over in this area. He wants to meet a few of his Facebook friends that live in this area and had asked me to join him for a few weeks of traveling to meet some of his friends with him, that is, after his lawsuit is settled. That's a big note from me, I barely even know him, much less his Facebook friends. So this is my story so far. Not sure how things will turn out, but as of right now, let's not meet Kemper and Aussie. They both scare me in ways I can't explain. I do love Kemper with all my heart, but he has a lot of issues he needs to work on before I ever consider meeting him, so it may never happen. I'm really hoping once I get a job working at a hospital that I will be able to find someone normal to date and spend the rest of my life with. Kemper tells me sometimes I need to move on because he's never going to change and I'm beginning to believe it. At the moment, I feel things with Kemper will never go any further than the way they are. It's hard though to get away from them, especially Kemper. He knows my address, phone number, email address. He can even make multiple Facebook accounts to send me messages. Even one time I had blocked Kemper on everything. He found a way to send me a message from an unknown number asking me to unblock him so we can talk. I have other stories I can tell you about men that I never want to meet again. But this story is the one that has the most effect on my mental health. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the Creepy Fox Podcast. If this is the first time you've joined us, then make sure to hit that subscribe button 
and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads coming here to the Creepy Fox. Also, if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like rating and a comment down below telling me what you all thought. And make sure to pick up some Creepy Fox merchandise if you like. That's available right below the video player. Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you to all our channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Medu Saldil, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Corey, and Sylvia. Thank you, of course, to all the regular viewers who constantly tune in and listen to the videos and share them with family and friends. It really does go a long way to help out the Creepy Fox family grow. Speaking of that, if you'd like to go ahead and share your own story for a future episode, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen, that's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. As you saw today, we did go ahead and feature some stories from Reddit. I have discussed this in the past, and because I want to go ahead and give you guys more videos without you having to wait forever for new uploads, I'll be going ahead and including stories from Reddit, along with the scary stories that subscribers send. Thank you for understanding. So, that's going to go ahead and do it for today. I'll catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care, and have yourself an amazing day.